Welcome to ADL's second annual statewide Juneteenth celebration. My name is Sharissa Thomas and I'm the Education Director for ADL Texoma. I'll be leading you through our event today where the theme is paying tribute to the journey. Although you will mostly see me, please know that there are multiple ADL colleagues who helped make this event a memorable experience we hope you have today. I want to personally thank them for all of their hard work and sharing their talents. I'd also like to thank our generous sponsors, American Airlines and Enbridge. It's through their support ADL can host such a prestigious guest speaker and offer program support to our educational programs like No Place for Hate and our Youth Summit. In our audience today, we have a host of diverse community partners who shared this event with their network. We appreciate you and we hope you enjoy the program. For those who are interested, you can access closed captioning and Spanish translation in today's program. Just look to your Zoom toolbar to enable that function. This year's celebration of Juneteenth is special not only because of our amazing audience and sponsors, but because this is the first year Juneteenth will be recognized as a national holiday. This is an accomplishment in large part to the hard work of grassroots people, many of whom are right here in Texas, like activist Opal Lee or the famous genealogist, Mr. Don Payton. Their decades commitment to Juneteenth has produced this country's first and only official holiday connected to the horrors of slavery. Whether this is your first introduction to Juneteenth or you grew up celebrating it, we hope you walk away understanding the history of Juneteenth, the context around it, why it's so important to the Black experience, and why it's so important to the full narrative of American history. We have a great event planned for you, and we hope you find it entertaining as well as educational. Our guest speaker is Pulitzer Prize winning historian, Professor Annette Gordon-Reed, and we'll get to her in just a moment. Now I'm going to give it to Cheryl for just a moment to tell you why Juneteenth is so important for ADL to recognize. Thank you, Sharesa. I am Cheryl Drazen, Vice President for ADL's Central Division, which includes our offices in Austin, Dallas, and Houston. For more than 100 years, ADL's mission has been to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to secure justice and fair treatment for all. Since we were together to commemorate Juneteenth last year, this historic day has become a national holiday. While we can celebrate that victory, an opportunity still exists to educate about Juneteenth's meaning. ADL Texas is proud to be able to do that with today's program. Our unwavering commitment to justice and freedom requires us to share this story that is rooted in the port of Galveston, an entry point into Texas. The journey to freedom is a recurring theme that connects multiple groups to one another. The shared experience of going from slavery to freedom is one that has bound the Jewish and African American communities. It is through this lens that ADL Texas committed to elevating the recognition of Juneteenth. Thank you for joining us and thank you for being a part of fighting hate for good. Thank you, Cheryl, for that bit of history and really setting the stage for why ADL is a part of this moment. We'll start off with the singing of the Negro National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. The original was written in, as a poem in 1900 by James Bolton Johnson during a pivotal time when African Americans were fighting for their place in this country and when Jim Crow was replacing slavery. Johnson's lyrics eloquently capture the solemn yet hopeful appeal for liberty. This song became a rallying cry for Black Americans and an anthem for the civil rights movement. In this rendition, spoken word is by Seven and the song is by Ray Beatty and the Greater Houston Choir. I think Mr. Johnson will be proud of their rendition. And feel free to sing along, lift every voice and sing. Lift every voice, let there be light. The creator had to use his voice and it's amazing that we have been given the same gift, yet we act as if we have the choice. Freedom ain't free. They say, let freedom ring. That's why you and I have to lift our voices and sing. Freedom came alive, 1865. Antioch Missionary Baptist Church, 1868, founded by none other than the Honorable Jack Yates. And I hope my ancestors know that the movement in the marathon is still in play. 
and we still lift our voices to this very day. Hey, everybody throw your V's up. Hey, everybody throw your V's up. Everybody throw your V's up. Hey, and everybody throw your V's up. Come on. Sing this little chant with me, y'all. Come on. I said, oh, oh, oh. Everybody in the room say, we got We got the victory. We got the victory. We got the victory. We got the victory. Yeah. We got the victory. Hey, hey, Tyreek, yeah. again, speak. Hey. Look, lift every voice, I'ma sing it out now. Well, I've never been a singer, I rap it out loud. So many times I had adversity backing me down, but I overcame through the pain, I laugh at it now. I had to push forward. So many times I wanna cry, I went like, good goodness. He intervened on my behalf, he's such a good lawyer. That's why I gotta tell the world like I was Tom Joyner. It don't matter what we going through, I'm fine now. Hey, Pastor Beatty said it best, you know our times now. We got the heart of a fighter, we like a lion now. And we done been through it all, it's hard to quiet down. I can't be quiet now. Voice. Yeah. And sing. Till of the heaven, heaven ring, ring with the harmony of liberty. Yeah. Let our rejoicing rise high as a lifting sky. Yeah. Let us march on to victory. Everybody say we got, we got the victory, we got the victory. And everybody in the room say we got the victory, we got the victory. Everybody online say we got it, we got the victory. Oh yes we do. We got the victory. Say we got the victory. Yeah. We got the victory. Hey, Tyreek, yeah, more me, speak, look. No matter what they say, you are destined for greatness. Woo! Don't let nobody steal your confidence. Be like the Matrix. Duck and dodge the bullets that they try to spray with. And let them know you about your business. You nothing to play Whoa! with. That's the way we roll. Yo, we influence the culture. They just go with the flow. And this is far from a secret. If you know, then you know. We living in a world of darkness. It's time that we glow. And together, let's grow. And unity as we go and touch the community. I'm sick of being tired. I'm sick of reading these eulogies. It's history. All this band together. Join hey, us. Hey, we can band together. I promise you the victory. Hey, we we got the victory, we got the victory. I decree and declare. We got the victory, we got the victory. That your rest shall be your best. We got the victory, we got the victory. Everybody. We got the victory, we got the victory. God bless. We got the victory, we got the victory. We got it. We got the victory, we got the victory. We got we got the victory, we got the victory. Go and peace. We got the victory, we got the victory. We got the victory, we got the victory. We got it. We got the victory, we got the victory. Thank you so much. That was truly inspiring. Our last performance will showcase the song Wade in the Water. This is one of the most significant encoded slave songs, and it's still sang in many contemporary gospel spaces today. The lyrics gave geographical hints for safer travel. To escaping slaves, the song told them to abandon the path and move on to the water. By traveling along the water's edge or across the body of water, slaves would throw off chasing dogs and their keepers off their scent. Throughout the years, Many variations of the song have existed, and therefore, it's been interpreted in many ways. 
but the spirit of the song is the same. It's about freedom. Just that this song has a message to escape slaves, let this rendition be a message to you about today's continued fight for freedom, justice, and equality. Seven will offer another poem interpretation of the song and we'll go right into the Greater Houston Choir. Enjoy. The water asked me for a kiss, Chris, cool. A suicide no paraphrase written by Langston Hughes. I wonder, I really wonder what they had to do, how much courage they had to have to overcome their fear to trust the water to take them to freedom when the water was the one that brought them here. How would they get free? Mother, father, brother, daughter. Make a change, we just broke the chains way through the water. Water's there steep, middle of the water deep. You hear the dogs barking so you know the slave master on his feet. How we get across, got another soul lost, weighed in the water, or all is lost. Say, wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God said it's gonna trouble the water. Say it again, say, wait in the water, say, wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Tyree, speak. Look, call me three fifths of a man, I was so insulted. I was waiting in the water before I was walking. Now they see that we some geniuses by how we talking. Went from runaway slaves to running corporate office. All the doubts and all the fears, we put them in the coffin. From picking cotton in the field to Jim Crow laws, and we've never fallen. Adversity, we face it often. We the children of the king, and should be hey. We are the sons and the daughters. We gotta stand on the making some time to reflect how you kept my family safe and kept us covered from death in this world they want to panic this pandemic's a mess but if we all come back in unity this is what i expect unity, supernatural unity. healing and bodies that strengthen the flesh that he will give us new life and fill us up with his breath and i expect nothing less in his name y'all i pray if you believe it can you say it? Hey. Thank you so much. That was truly beautiful. And now on to our amazing guest speaker, Professor Annette Gordon-Reed. She will share with us the history of Juneteenth and its significance to American history using a historical narrative as well as her personal narrative. And then we'll go into our Q&A. Cindy Willis will do the honors. Cindy. Thank you, Sharesa. As Sharesa said, my name is Cindy Willis and I'm a board member for ADL Texoma Region. And it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker. Annette Gordon-Reed is a historian and the Carl M. Loeb University Professor at Harvard. 
She is the author of several books and has won over 16 book prizes, including the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize in History for her book, The Hemingses of Monticello. Most recently, Gordon Reed released the New York Times bestseller on Juneteenth, telling the sweeping story of Juneteenth's integral importance to American history. Gordon Reed is also the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, a MacArthur Fellowship, and the National Humanities Medal. Professor Annette Gordon Reed, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very, very happy to be here and very, feel very privileged to enjoy those wonderful musical selections just before my talk that was really, really great and inspiring. Now, this is an interesting moment for me because I don't typically write about myself. I don't typically write about Texas. I am a scholar of the early American Republic and I talk about Jefferson and slavery and the Hemingses and at Monticello. But I decided along with my editor to do a change of pace and to write a book that would be both a memoir and a history, a history of Texas, a place that has a lot of has drawn a lot of attention and about which there are a lot of misconceptions. And Juneteenth is an opportunity to discuss the issue of, of slavery, uh, the issue of race and the legacies of slavery that continue to bedevil us today. I grew up celebrating Juneteenth with my family. It was a family and a community holiday. It was driven home to me that it was supposed to be the day that we celebrated the end of slavery in Texas. June 19th, 1865, United States Army General Gordon Granger came from Louisiana to Galveston, Texas to make the announcement that slavery was over in Texas. It seems sort of odd that this would be taking place two years after the Emancipation Proclamation and some months after Lee had surrendered at Appomattox, many people thought that this was a sort of a, a conspiracy that, that the uh, slave owners, the enslavers in Texas had kept the knowledge of slavery, slavery's end from blacks in Texas. That's not the case. They knew about the Emancipation Proclamation. Black people knew what white people knew in that society because they talked and they heard what they were saying. They understood that the Confederate effort was failing. The difficulty was that the army of the Trans-Mississippi kept fighting. The Confederates in Texas kept fighting even after Lee surrendered, which was really the signal that the effort was over for the Confederates, but they kept on. And in fact, the last battle of the Civil War was in Texas and the Confederates won. But by then they came to their senses and they understood that the effort was over and they surrendered at the beginning of June. That's why Granger was able to leave his post. He was in, in Louisiana and come to Galveston and to make this announcement. And he came with black troops who were part of this effort, who were an integral part of the effort of winning the war, preserving the union and ending the institution of slavery in the United States. Some say that he made this announcement from the balcony of the villa where he was staying, that he read it aloud, general order number three. Other people suggest, and this seems much more likely that he may have done that, but he also sent troops around throughout Galveston to read the order. Uh, there's a story of them putting it on the, uh, the uh, door, the front door of an African Methodist Episcopal church in Galveston to let people know what had happened. And there was great excitement about this, obviously. Even though, as I said, people had an inkling of what was going to happen. There are, I found reports of enslaved men who were working on the docks who were celebrating in the days before Granger got there and people asked them why they were celebrating. And they said, because we're going to be free. They knew what was coming even before he got there. But the announcement, the official announcement of it must have been and was a wonderful time for people who heard that the institution of slavery would be over in Texas. Now, general order number three is interesting for a couple of reasons, not just because it ended slavery. It's also interesting because Granger says something in general order number three that he really didn't have to say, but I think are very important words. After saying that slavery was over, he says in effect, and he uses the phrase absolute equality. He says that 
the former enslaved people would then exist in a state or be in a state of absolute equality with other members of society. That's a pretty big deal. Um, he didn't have to say that. He could have just said slavery is over and you know, everybody go about your business. But in invoking equality, it's my belief that he was hearkening back to the American Declaration of Independence, which talks about equality in the words that we all think are very important and the most famous parts of the Declaration, the preamble, that talks about the fact that holding it as a self-evident truth that all men are created equal. So the Declaration and Granger's reference to equality establishes equality as a basic bedrock American value. And indeed, we talk about the American Declaration of Independence as America's creed. And we know, of course, that merely saying that either in the Declaration or Granger saying it in uh, General Order Number 3 didn't make it so immediately. It's an aspirational idea. It's the thing that we should be working towards. But the fact that he said that is significant and it must have heartened people, gave um, confidence and happiness to the people who found out that not only were they no longer going to be treated as property, but they should expect that they had a share in the American creed as well and the value of equality. Now, one of the things that I found out, um, one of the many things that I found out working on this book was that while the enslaved people were happy, as you can expect, the people who had been enslaving them and the people who benefited from a society where slavery was a part of things, where slavery was racially based, that is to say, whites who were, may not have been slave owners, but benefited from being at a higher rung on the, on the, on the hierarchy than they would have been if there had been no uh, enslaved people in Texas, were very, very angry about this. And I found accounts of people being whipped, actually whipped for celebrating. There were instances where owners with using violence, the threat of violence and actual violence tried to maintain the system of slavery even after, after the announcement uh, in general order number three. It took the army going throughout Texas and other places throughout the South to basically enforce, to make and enforce contracts between the former enslaved people and, and whites who had, had used them as enslaved people beforehand. It took force to do this because people had been used to living for decades with the expectation that black people were to be treated as property. And I should also say, that Texas was a special case because Texas was relatively new uh, to the Union and the Confederacy compared to places like Virginia and, and Georgia and others. And as the war effort had started, many people from the southeastern part of the country came to Texas, rushed into Texas with enslaved people, hoping to stay ahead of the Army of the United States, hoping to stay ahead of the process of emancipation. So what you had in Texas were, was in some ways the most hardcore people who uh, were most committed to the institution. Texas, I know most people think of as a place of cowboys and cattlemen and oil uh, executives and so forth, oil, you know, wildcatters and so forth. It is that, but it was also a plantation society. And as being a part of a plantation society, it created a hierarchy, a racial hierarchy that put blacks at the bottom of the hierarchy. So once the system was crushed, once the, the system of slavery was destroyed, that did not mean that this hierarchy collapsed. There were still expectations on the part of the people who benefited from that, that the basic societal set, setup would remain the same. White, so on top, Blacks on the bottom, white supremacy was a part of and helped fuel the slave system and it existed afterwards. And that was very much present in Texas in June, after June 19th, 1865. The people were happy and I'm often asked whether we should celebrate 
Juneteenth or whether we should commemorate it. But I think we should do both. Celebration is appropriate because the people were in fact happy. They learned that the system of law that made it possible, that made it a part of everyday life to sell family members from one another, away from one another, never to be seen again, was over. And at least they would be able to have the security of their families under law. And that is a thing to celebrate. That is a thing to be joyous about. And so Black joy is a part of Black life as well. We can celebrate the wonders of the wonderful feeling that they had and the knowledge that that part of their lives was over, even though they understood that it was gonna be a hard road ahead of them, that they had a lot of work to do, a lot to be done, and they had hopes for the future that I think our celebration and commemoration honors by recognizing what they did and remembering what they did. And in fact, one of the most poignant parts of my research in writing this book was finding the story of the four black men in Houston, Texas, who had been former slaves, who pooled their resources, saved their money, pooled their resources, and bought land in Houston to celebrate Juneteenth. That expectation that future generations would note what had happened and would have a place to come to make that celebration, I think was a very poignant and a very important part of the story. And one of the reasons that I think it makes sense to continue to honor them and to honor what they did and in, the, in those times periods of celebrating even in the face of a lot of hostility. As was mentioned earlier, you know, this is a holiday that everybody can celebrate. I have to say, when I first found out that other people were celebrating it outside of Texas, I had a sense of uh, you know, possessiveness about it. And then I realized that doesn't make any sense. This was an advance in human rights. And everybody who's interested in the progress of the world should join in and be happy and recognize advances in human rights. So this is a story that belongs to everybody. So I hope going forward, all people, whatever color, whatever race, read or color, creed or color, will join in and commemorate and celebrate the day of that advance in human rights and understand that it's not over yet. We're still fighting for some of the same things that the people back then were fighting for, secure voting rights, all those kinds of things, the end of, of official police violence, all those things. But this is a way for us to come together and think about these moments and make plans for the future that are worthy of the people who suffered so much, but did have a moment of joy when Juneteenth was announced. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to take questions. We'll have a conversation about all this. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Professor Reed. Uh, I want to first say thank you so much for that, but I want to first say that your books are truly a treasure and I have so much admiration for your work. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. Um, so what, I'm going to ask you just a couple of questions because of time. I'm just going to keep it to one and then we're going to go to our audience. Because okay. We have a lot of questions for you. Many people have read your book and want and are watching today just to tune in to get an opportunity to ask you a question. Okay. So I have um, one question for you. Um, I'm a Texas girl, grew up in West Texas, and so I am very interested in the double consciousness that you talk about, the duality. Mm -hmm voice in your book. There's so many great points, but you talk about as a Texan, how you're kind of raised to be proud of Texas, everything's bigger in Texas, but mm -hmm. then we have to reckon with its history. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to know if you could talk about that and, mm -hmm. and kind of give more narrative to that in your experience. Well, it's very hard because I grew up, when I grew up, we had to take Texas history in the fourth grade and the seventh grade. And it was very you know, you're exhorted, as you said, to be proud of Texas, and it's a heroic vision of the state and the republic. And then I find out as a teenager that the state was in conflict with Mexico because Mexico had outlawed slavery. And part of the reason they wanted to have a republic was so that it could be a slaveholders republic and be certain about that. So how do you handle this? I don't know that there's a, 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 you know, a formula for everybody, but for me, uh, the idea that, you know, uh, that it's my family, my experiences with my family, their love for one another, the hopes that they had for the place, 
that's what defines Texas for me. It's not, I don't, I don't think the people who are negative, the people who, who are haters, that they necessarily, they don't define what Texas should be. There are many of good people in Texas and my focus is on them and what their aspirations are and hope for one day that you know, they will be able to make those values you know, statewide. So it is tough. I mean, it's, it's a real conflicting kind of thing to find that stuff out about the Alamo and Jim Bowie as a slave trader and all those kinds of things. But, you know, history is not just about good things. It's about good and bad things. So we have to, to tell the whole story. Absolutely. Thank you so much. You touched on so many good points there. Um, I next want, want to ask you about just celebrating Juneteenth and how, you, you know, you talk about you didn't set out to ask um, to write this book about your family. Mm-hmm. But can you share like what your family experience was in celebrating Juneteenth and mm-hmm so important and what that also looks like for our allies so um, mm-hmm. if you could share well you know Juneteenth for me as a kid was a day of drinking too much soda water uh firecrackers you know, and I still marvel at the fact that we were given firecrackers <laughs> and, and matches I mean I guess it's different ideas of parenthood in those days uh and It was a community holiday. We went from place to place. Kids came over to our house. If I was at my grandmother's house, my set of friends there came over. I went over to their house. If I, if we celebrated at home, you know, it was the same thing. It was a day that everybody got together. And so I associate the day, the the importance of the day, the end of slavery with family joy and family warm feelings and so forth. So that's what it was like for me. And that's what I think it could be like for everybody. It's, you know, it's the quintessential day for history, talking about, well, why are we celebrating this? Why is this important? But also of everybody getting together and white families, black families, Hispanic, all families, all types of families can have that sense of camaraderie and coming together on this day. And that's what it's really about because these were people who, as I mentioned before, lived in a world where they were never certain if they would be able to gather family together or they would always be together because they could be, they didn't lose them just to death. They lost people to sale and separation. And this holiday is the opposite of that. It's about everybody coming together. And again, that's something that everybody can feel uh, for, for their own families. Absolutely. Thank you so much um, for that thorough, that thorough answer. Um, Uh, We have a question from the audience, um, and this is from a corporate executive. You were talking about how we celebrate and how that can look different for different people. Um, And this corporate executive says, what is the best way to acknowledge and celebrate Juneteenth? I worry that most people will take the day as a holiday or regular day off to shop and hang out. Um, how How do you improve their understanding of this holiday and what could be meaningful for our African American colleagues? Well, you know, I I think that's going to be an issue because there's some people who will do that, like they do with all of our holidays. And I don't know so much that we can control that, but we can control what we do. And I think the best thing is to model behavior that suggests or that shows that Juneteenth is an important day. Uh, If you have children, talk to them about it. Uh, Raise the issue with people that you know, say that you're celebrating. You might attend some of the events that I know that are going to be going on in, in all cities now, I mean, they, they've been going on for, for some years now, but I, I think it's going to go into the hyperdrive now, attending these kinds of events, being present. I mean, your presence matters to people. And if you go to those kinds of events and you see other people see you there, it's a, and you show your support for all of these kinds of things. I think it's, it works better if we do what we can individually and with our families and sort of be a, a, an example, you know, serve as an example to other people. But yeah, it's gonna be a, it's a, gonna be a day off for some people, uh, just a day off and there's nothing wrong with that, but you can make it better by your participation in events and talking, even just talking to your children and your family and your friends about it. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, here is a question about, um, Um, you pose an excellent question in your book that really makes a case for um, exercising the complete narrative in documenting and teaching history. Mm-hmm. 
what is that morale? You ask the question, what is the morality would say, what is the morality that would say that the oppressor's version of historical events should take precedent over the knowledge of the oppressed? Mm -hmm. How do we incorporate this into our classrooms in this politically charged environment? That's very tough for teachers. I know that teachers are, are teaching under, so it seems like they're under surveillance in a way people are watching what they say. I think the best thing that you can do, the safest thing that can be done is to, and it depends on how, what age the, the students are, but is to use primary documents as much as you possibly can. You know, the constitution, for example, the constitution of the Republic of Texas openly supports slavery, openly says that African-Americans can't come to Texas without permission, can't live there without permission. I don't understand how you can teach about the Republic of Texas without giving people the constitution. So I think if you, you know, for people who feel as though they are under siege in some fashion, not to say that this might be a hundred percent answer, but you're better off if you talk, if you use primary documents, the actual documents of the time. I mean, people act as if we just started talking about race in the last 10 years or something. Mm -hmm. People talked a lot about race in the 18th and the 19th century. They were explicit about it in law, in articles, in the constitution, all those things. So I think as a, as a, there is maybe some safety in using primary documents, things that are from the time you're talking about. And when people come and say, well, how can you teach about this? Well, how do you teach about the, the Republic of Texas without the constitution? So I think primary documents might be a, a way of, well, I think should be a, a safer way of getting into things than you know just giving your opinions or whatever. I, don't, I know teachers don't do that, but people accuse them of doing that, but primary documents, I think, are, are a way to go when you're dealing with tough topics. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. Um, and we have some resources that we will share after this. Oh, so yeah, good. good. Those can, hopefully those can be helpful. Um, we have a question, two questions that are combined, and they are getting at the root of how did different parts of Texas react to the word of emancipation? For instance, this question is a, uh, says that their family is from uh, Galveston. Mm -hmm. How does that uh, look next to the reaction of far west Texas, far out past the Pecos River? How did those reactions to slavery look different? Mm -hmm. Well, they look different because you know different parts of Texas had a different stake in the institution of slavery and different numbers of Black people. What people don't think about quite a bit, a, a lot, maybe not enough, is that you know, slavery was an economic system, but it was also a system of social control. And in places where there were lots of black people, uh, the question immediately became, well, how, if we don't have them as, if we're not enslaving them, how are we going to control them? So there were laws passed to you know, limit black movement, to do all, you know, all kinds of ways to bring things, as one person said, as near to slavery as we back to slavery as we can get. And I think in places in the West, there were not as many black people. There, there was not the plantation society that existed in East Texas. So this is much more a, a problem, much more an issue in uh, Eastern Texas than it is in other places. Although white supremacy was all over Texas. Right. And so you have people, you know, l in later years, sundown towns where black people couldn't stop and couldn't stay there because of it. So, but the, the system of racial hierarchy covered all of Texas, but in terms of the sort of immediate and visceral things that had more effect on the lives of more black people who were largely concentrated in East Texas. But, you know, slavery created, racially based slavery created, as I said, a hierarchy and that hierarchy manifested itself all over Texas. Thank you so much. Um, in your book, you began with, uh, you began your talk about Texas, you begin appropriately with indigenous people mm -hmm. and so talk about uh, Texas as kind of a microcosm of the US. Can you talk more about that? You, you began with Esteban and can you talk more about uh, mm -hmm. 
found more about that indigenous. Well, you know, Texas embodies so many aspects of the American experience. It, it, it borders a foreign country. So the question of immigration comes up. There's the issue of Hispanic Anglo rivalry and contest for Texas, essentially, which also was, you know, an American context with contest with France and Spain and other parts of the country. You know, it had plantation economy, it had Jim Crow afterwards, it had it was a republic for it on its own. So it has all of those things. There's no other state that has all of those things. They have some of them, but not everything. Texas embodies all of it. And so it it has all aspects of America within itself. It also is a place that was, and people don't think of this as much because, and I say in the book that Texas is constructed as a white man. People think of Texas as, as white and male. But that's the image. But Texas was diverse from the very, very beginning. The different, different groups of indigenous people, some whose names are not known. I mean, people primarily think of the Comanche and the Apache, but there were many other groups besides that in Texas, before the Comanches and the Apaches arrived, they were there. And, uh, you know, that was one group. Then the Spanish come. And I talk about Estebanico, who was a black man who came, who was brought to uh, the new world, the so-called new world uh, with the Spanish and gets shipwrecked off of Galveston and ends up walking almost up totally across Texas, almost to California with his European compatriots or actually they're, they're his owners. He's an enslaved man. But once they get shipwrecked, he becomes, you know, they all have to survive. So he, he takes on a different, different role becoming a translator um, because he was gifted in languages between the indigenous people and the Europeans and himself too as well. So we have an African presence. We have the Spanish, as I said, who were there, then the English come along. So this group of people, all of the people that you think of in America, the sort of diversity of America is in this particular place. And so it's always been a place of conflict and a place of diversity. And we've had to learn how to manage it. And, you know, we're still working on that, quite frankly. It's still a difficult task. Some of the same things that I'm talking about in the book, you know, we see the legacies of all of that today when we talk about voter suppression and you know police brutality and brutality and all those kinds of things but you know that's what makes i think that's why texas is an important um, important place to look at to see where the country is going either for better or worse it has all of the things the country is experiencing in itself and it has from the very beginning Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. Um, we have a question about Juneteenth being celebrated in other places, mm -hmm. how that happened before the national holiday. Mm -hmm. And also someone said that um, they are not African-American and do you think that they would be welcome at a Juneteenth celebration and how should they conduct themselves? So three questions in one. Okay. Okay. Uh, the first one. Uh... It's how Juneteenth got to other oh, places. Oh, how it got to other places because Texans who left Texas, took it with them. And they talked about it. And someone asked me the other day, now, how is it that Texas gets a national holiday for its day of emancipation? And there are other states that have their own particular days and they don't. And I think it's probably Texas chauvinism. Uh, Texas, I mean, Texans took it, went other places and said, yeah, this is what we used to do. And now we have to do it here. And so they, brought it, they took it with them other places. Uh, how should, and, and this, this was before uh, obviously the federal holiday. And I think I should add that the internet in the mm -hmm. past 10 years, I think helped spread the holiday as well because people put up you know, you know, notices about it, pictures, all those kinds of things and it spread. And then I think the killing of George Floyd also expanded interest in it, you know, in May, and then the holiday come and people were thinking, you know, how did we get here? And people thought about the legacies of slavery. And then the next month you have um, Juneteenth. And this was a time for people to talk about, well, aha, you know, slavery, we are dealing with the legacies of slavery. And I think it really took off after that. Now, should white people come to celebrations? By all means, 
how you should act. You should act like the wonderful human being that you are. When you go into uh, social settings, there's nothing special you have to do except enjoy and be polite and respectful as you know we all try to do when we go places. And I think that will mean a lot <laughs> if you do that. Thank you, that was a, um, a great answer. Um, but this is, um, I'm sorry, I'm, this word is worded kind of odd. Um, they're asking, is Juneteenth the same as emancipation? What is the difference between the holiday as a status and as an emancipation status? Okay, uh, Juneteenth was originally called Emancipation Day. It does not, it did not emancipate all slaves in the United States. This is about Texas. The emancipation of all slaves, the, the end of legal slavery was December, 1865, when the 13th Amendment was ratified. What Juneteenth represents is the end of the military effort to maintain the system of slavery. The, the Confederates were fighting um, for that to maintain what they call their way of life. And as I said, in June of 1865, they gave that up. They gave up fighting about it, the military effort. And that's when Granger could come mm -hmm. in with the United States Army, black troops. Uh, and you wonder what that must have looked like to um, the enslaved population of Galveston. Someone asked a question before about Galveston. Um, when the troops arrived to be their liberators uh, in a sense. And, and so it's an important day because the fight for slavery, the war to maintain it, you know, killed almost 700,000 people and black soldiers were an integral part of the victory of the Union Army. And Juneteenth, I think, recognizes their contribution and recognizes the importance of putting down the rebellion to maintain the institution of slavery. Thank you so much. I think we're gonna, I'm gonna ask this question. I'm gonna see if I have time for one more after this. Um, there's a group that read your book and they're asking if you can expound a little on the experience of Bob White, the story of Bob White and Bennett Jackson. Mm -hmm. Well, Bob White was a story that I'd heard as a, as a child from my grandfather who knew Bob White. And uh, Bob White was accused in the late, in the thirties of raping a white woman in the town where I was born, Livingston, Texas. And my grandfather told me about this and he said, you know, they were, the phrase he used, going together. I guess that's what they used to say. And the husband found out about it and the woman accused Bob White of rape. So there's a trial. There's, uh, he is, the, the Texas Rangers take him out into the woods and beat him repeatedly, nightly, until he confesses. And he's tried. Uh, he's convicted, then there, there's another trial because of the beating, and it goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, which I didn't know. I'm a law professor, and I teach criminal procedure, and I didn't know that the case my grandfather used to tell me about uh, actually went all the way up to the Supreme Court, you know, until I was writing this book. It sent back down. The Supreme Court says that's a, you know, a violation of due process to beat people till they confess, and then, you know, uh, it goes back down. And while he's on trial, the husband of the woman shoots him in the courthouse in front of everybody and is acquitted, even though it's cold-blooded murder in front of the judge, jury, spectators, and everyone. And that, that was just a, that was such a, a shock. Well, not a, a shock, but it was such a hurtful thing that many, many people in my family would not spend the night in, in Conroe. This is where it happened. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, the, the town where I grew up. Uh, because of something like that. That's the kind of, that was the atmosphere of the town and lynching, you know, that uh, took place there as well. Yeah, absolutely. And that must have, must be difficult for you now, knowing that history of that, that area. But I think that they've honored you with a mural and a bus and named a school after you. And so um, that, that, is there, do you feel any conflict there? Well, it's strange. Oh, it's strange. I, I was just, um, you know, it's, it's odd, you know, to, um, you know, have integrated our schools. And I was just back in Conroe two days ago, and the school will be open in August, and I will go in October for the dedication. So, and I will be very, very happy to do so. It, sh it things have, you know, things are not perfect, but things have changed. That would have been impossible when I was younger. 
Thank you so much. And congratulations on that. Thank you thank so you. much for your time with us. We, I could talk to you really like all, all day. So thank you so much for your time and for your questions. Um, I want to give you one second if there's anything that you would like to say before, before we close out. No, it's just that I hope that everybody enjoys Juneteenth. Uh, it is a holiday, as I said, for everybody of all races, those who are, you know, you know, who are allies, who want to be allies, show up at events and have a good time. And that will speak volumes. And that's what, we, that, that's what needs to happen. You know, we've made progress in this world, in the United States, when people of goodwill, whites of goodwill have joined in efforts, whether it was the abolitionists or whether it was people involved in the civil rights movement coming together and saying, you know, there's a better world to be had and we want to make it. Thank you so much for that. Wise words. We appreciate that. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you, talented artists who joined us today. Uh, thank you for your expertise, Professor, for and sharing your personal story. Thanks again to our sponsors, American Airlines and Enbridge, who made this possible for us. Uh, we pay tribute to the journey. We acknowledge the many roles and contributions of African-Americans to our society. We acknowledge the joy and the pain this day may represent. We embrace the past as well as the future. The actual holiday is Sunday. And since, since it is a national holiday, you will see different people celebrate in different ways. Even among the black community, not all celebrations will look the same. Some people may celebrate and some may not, and that's okay. As long as you approach the holiday and the history with respect, you should be fine. And I hope you enjoy. We at ABL always like to end our calls with a call to action. And challenge, so I challenge you to share what you have learned today with others. Let this information be a starting point for you to do further research and move from awareness to action. Urge your local school districts to include a full narrative of history that includes the perspective of all people. Partner with organizations who are already doing this work. We can't do everything, but we each can do something. ADL has created several resources you will find useful, like a discussion guide for Juneteenth, as well as tips to get involved in advocacy. You'll receive that helpful list along with the recording of this event by email. I'll leave you with the last, with the last line of the Negro National Anthem. Let us march on until victory is won. Thank you so much and take care. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.
Thank you everyone for joining us. This concludes our program for today.